a very special interview now. Uh, so Jeremy Greenstock has had a long and distinguished career as a diplomat, having served in the British diplomatic service in various capacities. He served in Washington DC, Paris, Dubai, and in Saudi Arabia, um, and he was the permanent representative of the United Kingdom to the United Nations in New York for five years during which he presented the resolution to the General Assembly recommending the 21st of September as the International Day of Peace. In, 2000, in 2003 to 04, he was the UK's special representative for Iraq after the invasion of Iraq and the fall of Saddam Hussein. He subsequently directed the Ditchley Foundation's International Conference Centre and since 2010 has chaired his own geopolitical advisory company interpreting global change for the corporate sector. Before we meet him, let's see him in action 20 years ago, presenting the General Assembly resolution establishing the first ever day of ceasefire and non-violence with a fixed date. It's been 20 years since the resolution passed, establishing 21st of September as the UN International Day of Peace, a day of ceasefire and non-violence. President, the United Kingdom and Costa Rican governments have now joined together to strengthen and reinvigorate what we believe is a unique and still largely unfulfilled opportunity for the practical furtherance of peace. The need for such an enhanced approach was originally brought to our attention by a UK-based organisation, Peace One Day. This draft resolution recommends that henceforth the UN International Day of Peace be observed as a global ceasefire day. The draft suggests that this day be fixed as the 21st of September. It is so decided. So Jeremy Greenstock there at the United Nations General Assembly back in 2001. And it's an honour to introduce him now, being interviewed by our very own Peace One Day founder, Jeremy Gilley. Please welcome Sir Jeremy Greenstock. Well, it's wonderful to see you, Sir Jeremy Greenstock. Great to be back in contact, Jeremy, after the 20 years that we've seen go by. So let's talk about it. Yeah, great. So could you tell us, um, you know, first about, you know, your journey and your career? Well, all my family practically were schoolmasters. I started as a schoolmaster immediately after university, realised that wasn't for me for a career's worth. So always being interested in the world, the big picture, travel, what other countries were doing. I thought about the Foreign Office, gave it a go, got in and stayed with it for 35 years. Fairly conventional career, I learned Arabic. I moved around different parts of the world, Middle East, uh, Europe, North America. Was in uh, Washington twice, uh, New York at the end. So a nice varied career, but it suited my philosophical look at the world to be an observer and to some extent a pr practitioner in connections between different countries. Classics was my education. Uh, the, the lessons of Greece and Rome still feed into everyday life in the most relevant way. Um, so it's been a wonderful practical and thinking journey that I've been on. And since I left the service of government in 2003, I've been involved in uh, bringing people together to talk about the way the world is going. I've started a company with my son to look at the geopolitical big picture and interpret it for the business community to see how they can get a feel of what is really going on under the surface. So what you've been doing, Jeremy, is really, re really relevant to all of that, to try and make sure that this is a world that connects and works together uh, and doesn't shoot itself in the foot. Could you tell us about um, your role in the resolution that fixed the date of the International Day of Peace is the 21st of September and established it as a day of global ceasefire and non-violence. Well, it was a wonderful team effort. I think you've done a lot of work with the Foreign Office in London and with my mission in New York. And they brought it to me and said, this is really worth your time. Please focus on it. Are you prepared 
to do a statement to the General Assembly, which is fairly rare for an individual ambassador outside the normal run of General Assembly agendas. Um, and it was wonderful, a privilege to be standing up in front of the 191 members, as it was then, of the General Assembly, to be talking to them about how they could focus on communication, compromise and peace. This draft resolution recommends that henceforth the UN International Day of Peace be observed as a global ceasefire day. The draft suggests that this day be fixed as the 21st of September. It is so decided. And I think it was very significant to do that uh, in the General Assembly and not the Security Council, which was my normal place of work. Of course, we preceded 9-11 by four days, so we got it in at the right time. And to make 21 September the annual day of peace is still significant, I think, in 9-11 terms. And 20 years on, there's a lot of uh, talk again about 2001 and 9-11 and what it all meant. And we've made Peace One Day relevant to that whole journey since that extraordinary pivotal event. For those who, who don't know, who might not be familiar um, with your role, could you talk to us about your position and what it takes um, to establish a day of peace with a fixed calendar date? Well, the UN is a unique forum of different, every different nation and is a place of huge connection, uh, action and compromise. And you have to establish yourself as a permanent representative of your country at the UN, doing the job of your government in your country, obviously, under instructions from London. But you have to establish a personal rapport with almost every other ambassador in the business, because you might have to deal with any of them at any one time. And the UK mission and its heads have always been extremely diligent in creating those relationships. So I'd been in New York for nearly three years by the time that we did this together in 2001. So I think I, I had a position, I had a reputation. I was a permanent member of the Security Council, so people were watching what I did, whether they thought I should be there or not for the UK. Um, we were still, I think, are fighting for our position as permanent members. But the UK makes itself relevant to the United Nations by joining with everybody else to try and solve shared problems. We spend a lot of time on that. And this peace in the world was the archetypal shared problem. And to show ourselves relevant through this presentation on the 7th of September was very much in the mould of what I was trying to do with the UK mission during my time there. Um, so there are now millions of people celebrating this day across the entire world with activity in every country. About 1.4 billion people fully aware, 3 billion fully aware by 2025, we think. The day when more, when more people are th thinking about peace than any other day of the year, the day where there's the greatest reduction of violence across our homes, communities, schools, places of work and in, in countries. I mean, incredible what you did, right? I mean, it's, a, it's amazing. But can you tell us about the importance I mean, I've just mentioned some examples, but a, a day like this, a day where people can come and sit around the table. You created it. Was that really important to you? Well, Jeremy, you conceived this and it was your activity that made it happen. So I repay the compliment. It's your creation. And what you conceived was a socket for people to plug into when they wanted to do something about ending violence. So often, particularly our younger generation, they often say to me when I'm talking to schools or universities or in United Nations Association meetings or whatever it is, what can we do? How are we relevant? And I say, you've, you've got to conceive what the world, you've got to think globally, but you've got to act locally. You've got to find some way of acting. And to have a peace one day 21 September day means they've got a socket to plug into to focus on when they want to take action in their own community, their own locality. 
Given that 95% of, uh, of violence globally happens in our homes, schools, local communities and places of work, could you talk to us about the importance of every individual becoming involved in the process of establishing a more peaceful and sustainable world? I mean, what could we say to the two individuals to make them understand that they're crucial? Well, the individual is much more powerful nowadays uh, than he or she ever was because of the greater freedom, the spread of information, the spread of connectivity. Governments have leached power and, have, and feel it. That's why governments behave so strangely sometimes nowadays. They feel the loss of their monopoly of power because the individual has so much more. But with that greater number of tools in each hand in the human race comes a responsibility. You can't have the privilege of connectivity and action and information and freedom without taking some responsibility. And what Peace One Day does is that everybody has a responsibility to get rid of violence in their lives. And then they want to know what is the mechanism for that? How can we do it? Um, now, we're talking utopia here. There are at least half the planet is not thinking about this and won't think about this. Uh, and respond with violence when they become frustrated or angry or threatened or fearful. So you'll never get rid of violence. The human race is a violent organism. But just anything that gets rid of some violence in the world is extremely important. So the more we reach out to people and say, it's your individual responsibility, or you cannot enjoy the freedom that the modern world gives you, makes them realize that there is a contract, a compromise to be had. And that's a very important message. We created a show called Climate Action Live on the 21st of June. And we coined a, a, little, a very simple little phrase. It's not a big deal. But no climate action, no peace. How meaningful is that statement to you? And is, and is it right? No, no climate action, no peace. It's simplistic. And it's not literally true. But it reminds people that they're connected, peace and sustainability. So it's extremely important. You have connected them. But climate action um, individuals and groups and communities must be careful not just to demonstrate and advocate something that is not achievable. You might say no poverty, no war, as, a, as another simplistic statement. And the energy that's been produced by the hydrocarbons industry over the last 120 years has produced an immensely less impoverished planet and has enabled a peaceful approach in an extraordinary number of countries with the help of the UN since 1945. Do you have hope for humanity? I'm split. Uh, sometimes I despair at the stupidity of some decision-making um, <clears throat> and the closed minds that you come up against. But I have great hope in the younger generation because I think they are immensely adaptable. I have great hope in science and technology because it is a most marvellous tool. It can lead to bad things as well as good things, to bombs as, as well as medicines, but there is the potential, but it needs organisation, that needs leadership, that needs thoughtfulness. Human beings have got to fight against their nature to preserve peace. There's, there's never been a period in human history where there hasn't been war. The longest, perhaps uh, artificially you could say, the longest period of peace between great powers, with some exceptions, was between 1815 and 1914. So call it 100 years is the maximum, give or take uh, the Franco-Prussian wars and some disturbances in Europe in the, the mid-19th century, but big power peace lasted for 100 years. That's the record. In, 19, in 2045, we will be 100 years on from the end of the Second World War. The human race has got to do something unprecedented to extend that period of peace between great powers between really dangerous powers beyond 100 years, unprecedented 
in terms of compromise, in terms of submerging our subjective and our nationalistic feeling. And I'm not sure yet that we can do it because it needs tremendous leadership to be able to change that tendency to be competitive uh, and in the end to use violence. So the uphill climb for peace one day is enormous and I think in the next 25 years is going to get greater because that 100-year point uh, in history has always been a point of exhaustion of people working together. Could you tell us why it's critical, given the current situation in Afghanistan, that all parties around the the table sort of come together? Well, the importance lies in bringing all the stakeholders in any particular issue together. Because if you leave some out, whatever you do as a minority area of stakeholders will be distorted by other actions you haven't coordinated with. So it's extremely important to have everybody involved around the table. Second, it's extremely important to talk talk to people you don't like talking to because they're the ones that are going to get in the way of what you want to do. So reaching out to your adversary or even your enemy or the person you don't like talking to is a great part of taking the next step towards achieving something collective around the world. Of all the things that you've learned in your career, what one thing would you say that might inspire us on our individual journeys? I think the most important thing is to listen. There's too much transmitting goes on nowadays, particularly in social media. Social media is the enemy of listening. Listening is the creation of peace. So we must think through that. And the second thing I say to young people, I repeat, think globally because the world is yours, but act locally. Because as young people, act in your own group, university or school or your company, whatever it is, your family. Act locally. In But as you get older and more senior, your local will expand. And when you get to the top jobs, your local will actually be very broad and you'll be acting nationally and internationally, but get into the habit as a youngster of acting locally. Think globally, act locally. Well, it's been amazing listening to you. I mean, I, my, my life in the last 20 years was shaped because of something that you've done. And I thank you for that. You picked up that moment and did something with it and expanded it and went on expanded it. You could have given up in despair the things that were going on around you in the world when you were trying to fight for peace. So to have made the massive spread of interest in Peace One Day what it is nowadays is a tremendous achievement. So congratulations on your 20-year anniversary. Thank you, Sir Jeremy, for everything you did. Such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. (laughs) 